Hi everyone, I would like to welcome everyone uh, to the XDP workshop. Um, so before before we start, I would like to discuss uh, the agenda today. And uh, before we dive uh, deep into technical details, I would like to take the chance and introduce today's topics and our panel members. And uh, if we have the chance, I would also try to quickly review XDP development updates in the past year and the current ongo ongoing related work to the talks uh, and uh, discussions we will have here today. After that, we will move to a 10 to 15 minutes technical discussion for the following topics. Uh, we will start with the XDP hints. Uh, which is basically passing metadata from driver to XDP programs. And uh, then uh, David uh, Iron here, he is part of the uh, panel and he will summarize his experience with XDP and uh, will show some pain points he been experiencing while using XDP. Um, uh, also, please note that David will have a detailed tutorial on this topic and uh, in this conference, and so please don't hesitate to join his session. Uh, for that, uh, David will discuss the uh, XDP egress and development status and the uh, use case. Uh, then we will move to uh, multi buffer for XDP uh, by Samir Jobran. And uh, then Elias will talk about XDP time sensitive networking and uh, time stamping for XDP. Um, busy poll support for eight XDP sockets uh, by Sridhar from Intel. And uh, last thing we're going to discuss today, uh, it's going to be an open mic discussion, but uh, mainly uh, we're going to discuss uh, some performance aspects. Uh, uh, XDP performance, page pool, and uh, zero copy with header data split. Uh, mostly work by Jasper, Jonathan. Uh, uh, they will be discussing uh, their work uh, on this area. And uh, for each uh, topic here, we will have, we'll try to have five minutes average questions and free discussion. Um, just before we dive in, I uh, would like to uh, discuss or just review the development updates in the past year. I, I, I'm sure there were more than this, but these are the topics or features that uh, slightly relate to our discussions today. So XDP programs in, in MAPS, CPU and DivMAPS, which is basically the implementation of XDP egress was accepted uh, PPF XDP adjust tail to grow the packet size beyond its tail. Uh, lots of bulking improvements and uh, page pool adaption for many drivers and many areas of the stack. And uh, this is a lot of work done by Jasper and uh, Toki uh, to improve uh, using bulking mechanisms that we were talking about in the past few years. Um, one interesting topic is the introduction, introduction of dynamic program extension by Elixir, where you can uh, change the behavior of your XDP program without even uh, unloading and reloading the program itself. Um, some improvements to the page pool where we made it no malware by Jonathan and I, and we will discuss this briefly in the performance. Um, also, a lot of work on AFXDP. Uh, I attached some links. I'm not going to discuss all of these in detail, so please you know, go see the related work. Um, also, lots of driver made it uh, and implemented XDP, so we, we're, we're seeing many drivers are trying to uh, implement XDP. Uh, a lot, lots of drivers also are closing the gaps, implementing more and more features like features like Security Direct, XSK support, and uh, trying to adopt the page pool mechanisms and make it more standardized and used uh, widely uh, amongst drivers. Uh, stuff that are in progress and they will discuss today. XDP. I'm, I'm sure there are a dozen more. 
uh, please speak up today if you are working on something interesting. Uh, we will discuss it. But mainly, we are working on XDP hardware hints, a multi buffer, uh, access for FDB, uh, FDB for bridges, so implement bridges in XDP program, and uh, zero copy and uh, performance update uh, improvements for XDP to allow use cases like uh, GPU zero copy and uh, many other uh, stuff. Uh, so for our first topic today, uh, we're gonna discuss XDP hardware hints. So motivation for XDP metadata is that uh, today XDP programs do not see anything other than the packet data itself. We're missing lots of information, and uh, informations and uh, offloads and hints can be provided by hardware. And today they are not provided to XDP programs, and which makes uh, XDP uh, very hard to work with when uh, some offloads are enabled, like VLAN stripping, and imagine that you're uh, writing an XDP program where you don't know the checksum status and you need to calculate it by hand in the XDP program. So uh, offloads, hardware offloads are great for acceleration, and uh, it's it is really a low-hanging fruit that we can uh, just enable easily today. Uh, we just need to discuss some design details. Um, also waiting for a, a full XDP uh, offload support for, uh, in every vendor will take years and I think uh, vendors are trying to move away from that. Uh, so agenda for today, we'll discuss current API requirements and the tools we have today to achieve this uh, BTF uh, type format, for example. Uh, then we'll discuss high-level design, uh, how drivers are going to um, register their BTF uh, format for their metadata, and how the user is going to read it, interpret it, and try to write programs according to that. We will try to see some examples if we have the time. Let me just make a time check. So uh, we have uh, around 10 minutes to finish this. Um, so XDP metadata, we, we, uh, we already have the buffer uh, ready for us. Many, many hardware vendors and drivers uh, already have headroom before each packet data preserved for this use case specifically. And uh, we just have, uh, we, we have the tools to uh, populate it. Uh, and as you see in this diagram, how the, uh, what's the format of the XDP buffer today and how it looks like in most drivers. So we're just gonna utilize that uh, to make it happen. And write uh, the metadata from the hardware hints into this uh, buffer area before the packet data. Um, so the tools we have is XDP adjust meta. It's, uh, it's a helper function, XDP helper function that is available for drivers and for uh, uh, for XDP program to uh, adjust metadata and uh, write to it, populate it with uh, whatever information we want. Just a note here, we have also adjust head, which might conflict with the metadata buffer, uh, but we're gonna talk, I will, I will uh, talk about the use case that uh, this could uh, be hurtful. Uh, so again, the easy part, we, we have the tools, we just need to define the standard, and um, w basically the requirement here is that we need a standard that uh, we can advertise uh, the format of the buffer that the hardware wrote to the uh, metadata uh, section, and uh, using the standard uh, XDP programs can read it, interpret it, and uh, uh, work according to that. We need also dynamic metadata settings. We don't want to re-implement the SKB. Uh, we actually are trying to improve that. So the way to improve it is to allow a dynamic metadata population. If you need on only VLAN, so you get only VLAN. Other than that, we don't... Uh, uh, um, we didn't waste buffer space, so you get the VLAN in the metadata. If you need VLAN and checksum, you get VLAN and checksum, and uh, et cetera. Uh, we also want XDP metadata direct access uh, 
at runtime or compile time. We don't want lookups or hashes to look for the needed metadata. So we want uh, full wire speed without any delays or overhead. Uh, so we are going to use BTF uh, type format, which is a mechanism that was uh, pushed in the past year to the kernel. Uh, not going to talk about this. Uh, basically, this is our standard way to describe uh, types, uh, C types, or in binary, and uh, they can be shared between kernel space and user space uh, to interpret the format of a specific buffer. Uh, High-level design, um, basically we want the driver and firmware to keep a specific layout of metadata and DTA format. Uh, any driver can register and advertise its own DTA format. Um, user or driver will query the uh, gener this generated BTF format of a specific vendor and will generate a C header file and will just compile their own program with this. And um, they will get access to the uh, metadata buffer. Um, we will also discuss them. So this allows also proprietary and standard uh, offloads, like maybe checksum, um, VLANs, and uh, whatever you can think. If you're using special vendor with special uh, hints, you can get that with the proprietary BTF format. But uh, we at least need to keep a subset of uh, standardized fields that should at least share the same attributes like name and length and type for each and every vendor. Uh, data flow, how, how this will work. So on driver load, driver will register BTF type format for XDP metadata. And uh, basically this is the option where you, when you enable metadata, this is the format you get. This is the fields you will get in the metadata buffer. Uh, then kernel will verify validity of this BTF and will store this BTF for each driver. Um, then you can come from user space and using BPF tool, you can uh, query XDP, uh, this BTF uh, format from the driver, parse it and dump it into C header file, and then you can write your own program which is going to enjoy the offloads of this uh, driver. Um, after that, you can request to turn on XDP metadata and request the BTF that you used for that metadata and um, load your program and then the driver knows which BTF you are expecting and your, your program already knows what BTF to use and how to interpret the metadata buffer. And uh, the kernel will do the cross checks needed and uh, after that, the driver is enabled, everything is enabled, uh, that is flowing, and uh, BTF and the metadata is populated correctly. This is an example code of how a driver register uh, a BTF uh, format. It's uh, basically from the design, you can register as many formats as you want. Uh, so this is to allow the generic and dynamic uh, enablement of uh, various fields. In this example, we see that uh, we're providing hash and flow mark uh, in MLX5 driver. Uh, let's discuss the Netlink user API. So uh, we're going to add some uh, sub command uh, for XVP and it will show that uh, on a specific net device, metadata BTF is, in, is, uh, is available. We have ID1 and uh, BTF is not enabled yet. We can dump it into C header, fi C header file. So this is what uh, can be enabled, this uh, struct, which can be used to populate the metadata from th on this specific uh, interface. So it has checksum, uh, hash, mark, flow mark, and VLAN, and some specific offloads that are only specific to this driver, where you can just use and access from uh, your XDP program. Uh, but then you can just turn it on and uh, compile your program and start working with it. Um, this is an example uh, user program. So uh, 
if you see it, the, uh, the include file here is gen auto generated and we just included it and uh, you just point to metadata uh, section from the context which is the XBP uh, buffer and uh, just have you need to have a um, an if statement which validates the valid which validates the uh, existence of the metadata if the metadata really exists then from your program you should know that it has this exact struct type and you just access it using c uh, style uh, syntax like md and the hash and you get the hash directly without any hassle um, in my uh, code, uh, which is not upstream, but it's ready to be upstream, I'm just, I just got busy lately and couldn't upstream it, but um, I'm hoping to, to make it upstream very soon. Uh, some examples that I also changed, uh, for example, to just to see that this is working, uh, XDP sample packets will now show the metadata if it was enabled. Uh, redirect CPU can enjoy a lot from this. Uh, today, redirect CPU is calculating the hash by itself. Uh, now it can use the hash from the metadata. XDPTX IP tunnel, today it has uh, some lookup table tables and it, it's doing a lot of uh, processing, processing the packets to find out uh, like the five tuple to which tunnel they belong. This can be accelerated using uh, TC flow mark and the uh, XDP metadata which uh, the driver can provide the meet, the hardware can provide the flow mark saying, okay, this this five tuple, and this should go to this uh, tunnel. Um, this uh, got accelerated, I believe, by 60 or 70% packet rate. I don't have the new numbers. Uh, this was a year ago, but uh, that's the main idea. And um, just a note here uh, that XDP programs are going to do uh, to read the metadata and uh, consume it. But if they leave it there and the next program and the same program, they are going to do uh, just head, just to expand the header, uh, then we get a performance hit, um, which is a meme move because you're trying to expand your header into the metadata buffer and we don't want to override it. So a uh, possible solution here is once you get the metadata consumed, you can adjust meta and uh, just uh, invalidate the metadata and, and the memo will be avoided. Um, so this is a guide on how we, uh, this works. Um, and uh, this is basically it. So uh, next we need to define the TX hint usage. How we're gonna do it for XMIT. It basically should be the same, but uh, it's not defined in this design. We need to talk about what uh, standard offloads they need to be aligned in each and every vendor because checksums, hash, um, flow mark, they are all standard fields which should be standardized and they should look the same. So you could use the same metadata BTA format for multiple uh, vendors. Um, one downside of this is that today you need to recompile your XDP program per NIC vendors. Uh, there are some uh, solutions for this uh, to make the verifier uh, adapt or instrument the code in a way that uh, it, uh, it adapts your program to the vendor you're running on. So just uh, binary code restructuring and uh, the verifier can do this. Uh, given that we uh, resolve all the standard fields and standard offloads and we can reorder them in the program so they can work on the uh, specific vendor. Uh, we also need to figure out AFXDP, how this works with AFXDP. Basically, it should be the same, but I did not think about it. So um, that's basically it. And uh, any questions, uh, comments? I, I do have a question. So right now, if XDP changes the packet and it gets delivered to the core stack, does that mean that all the checksum stuff is broken? Exactly. So this is why uh, we disable checksum. So in MX5, we have checksum complete. And uh, 
imagine checksum uh, the way that checksum complete is that the checks the, the the stack believes that the checksum that provided in the SKB is the correct checksum for the all all of the bytes in the SKB, right? So if you touch it in the XDP program, that's there that this is immediately this immediately uh, invalidates the checksum and make it wrong. So in MLX5, for example, when you load an XDP program, we immediately go and disable checksum complete and go back to the basics of checksum uh, valid bits. And also for that, I don't think it's correct because so the original packet had a valid checksum, but now once after you modified it in the XDP program, uh, these checksum validation bits do not really uh, correspond to the new packet. So yeah, we have an issue today and uh, XDP hint uh, should resolve that. Thank you. And uh, yeah, so if you want, for example, <clears throat> so today our, the hints are used in the other way, right? So we know how to pass uh, hints from the XDP program to the stack, to the SKB metadata. But we don't know how to do the other way around, from driver to the XDP program. And uh, we need to do a two-way communication between XDP, between driver XDP program and back to the driver. For example, if we change the packet and you would like to keep checksum complete feature on, we need a way to, from the XDP program, to tell the driver, hey, this is the new checksum complete. So we give it the checksum complete, the original one, uh, XDP program uh, changes the packet, then modifies the new checksum complete accordingly and should provide the checksum complete back to the driver. So it's gonna populate the correct field in the SKB. Um, so it's a two-way protocol. This, uh, uh, this metadata should be a two-way protocol between driver, uh, then program, then back to the driver. Are, are you envisioning that you simply copy the transmit descriptor into the beginning of the packet or? Yeah, that could be a possible solution because BTF can be, can describe anything. If you want to put the whole descriptor, then fine. Just describe it in BTF and user program will read it and understand it. That's a vision. And for future hardware, you just, maybe you don't need to copy the descriptor. You can configure the hardware in a way that it, it writes the exact uh, BTF format that you requested. And you would save a copy on driver. Saeed, I have one question. Uh, so does this framework allow an XDP program to uh, specify metadata per queue, uh, different metadata? Um, no, actually, uh, yeah, this is, so today basically don't have a peer queue control on XDP queues. It uh, doesn't work that way. It, it can happen once we have a net device queue API, uh, which we were talking about for the past year. I think Magnus and Jasper tried to figure out a solution for this but we don't have the uh, means to, uh, the, the knobs to control it. But it can, it can be done if your hardware supports it and if your driver supports it. And I believe today you can run different programs uh, using CPU maps, um, but uh, yeah, so theor theoretically you can have different programs running on different uh, CPUs uh, but but uh, the the connection between CPUs and drains it's uh, really not hard it's it's hard coded today and just uh, don't have the control which queue uh, belongs to which CPU and what what this queue should how this queue should behave so we need to figure out the APIs first. Said yeah. There, yeah. There, there's a there's a question in the chat which is interesting, which is. Which is, uh, if you use ETH tool to configure, you can disable, enable different, uh, the, the, the different uh, offload features, right? And how, how, do we, how do we avoid that? Uh, let me just uh, try to figure out what this means. Uh, yeah, so we have ETH tool today to disable and enable uh, 
features, but it's a, it's a global features per hardware. You don't have it per queue, right? So yeah, so you could so uh, one thing is that we could just lock it. So say you once you enable it with BTF tool, then then you are not allowed to to change the the same settings that affects the hints you wanted. Uh, but I'm not sure how good that is. But it is I, don't, I don't believe there is a conflict. Yeah. Uh, but why would you think so? If I disable checksum and you start getting checksum zero, this means it's disabled. So exactly okay. like how it works with SKB, right? If you disable checksum offload, you will say, okay, this checksum, this packet has no checksum offload. We, we need to also have the bit in the descriptor explaining that. I think we should keep them mutually exclusive. Uh, otherwise, it's a lot to, otherwise, it's a lot of uh, overhead with, with the drivers to try to cross-check uh, BTF format with the current enabled features. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. OK, uh, off to the next topic. Um, so David wanted to talk about the XDP pinpoint and XDP egress. Um, so I know the itinerary listed this as five minutes on pain points and mostly talking about uh, egress, but I'm actually going to flip that. I'm going to have just a simple summary about the egress status and focus mainly on the pain points. So to set the context, um, this is an example of a typical networking setup for a hypervisor. Essentially, multiple ingress NICs into an LACP bond. Uh, the tab devices for the virtual machines are connected to a bridge, and that's its way of getting access to the bond. Um, so the goal of what I was going after with XDP is to have no SKBs in the host for 90 plus percent of VM traffic. So basically, XDP provides this fast path, and the bridge is the slow path for any kind of unknown traffic, however you want to define unknown. And while XDP has a lot of really awesome possibilities, there's a lot of pain points which are kind of, uh, I would say, restricting the, the argument for making XDP the networking today. We need some, some changes done. And we'll start with the hardware acceleration piece of that. Um, right now, if you want to make, if you want to write an XDP program that makes a VLAN-based decision, you have to disable VLAN offload. Right. And so that gets to be an extremely hard sell to say, hey, I've got this really cool software networking feature I want to use. So software acceleration feature, but you got to disable your hardware acceleration features first. Right. That's that's going to that's a non winning proposal to people who don't understand some some of the details. And hardware hence is one way to address this problem. And I guess I'm kind of making an appeal that we need to get this committed as opposed to you know, dragging out discussions and thinking about what's the right way to do it. We need something working today because, you know, timely solutions to these problems are essential. And, you know, Shahid shared his, his patches with me and even gave me the, the idea of marking the excellent packets, for example, using TC offload. And the performance gain is just crazy to be able to have the hardware tag the excellent packets so the XTB program can say, I don't need to parse it or I do need to parse it and then pop that header and do the forwarding based on the inner packet. So it makes a huge performance difference. And really this is just kind of appeal like we, we got to get moving on, on uh, the solutions. But that said, I also want to make the argument that some of these, some of this data in 2020 is really kind of fundamental properties of networking, you know, high speed networking in a data center at this point. Right, so for example, hash and VLAN are two that come to mind. Um, VLAN is actually a property of the packet itself and as opposed to some kind of metadata about the packet. And even the hash, you know, um, you can argue the hash is more metadata, but in a sense, the kernel stack makes so many decisions based on it that if it exists from the hardware, we really need to take, take advantage of that and have that that data follow the XTP frame, for example, and then make it, make it available to XTP programs through the XTP context. And an example of that is you get a packet coming into the host, you redirect it to a tap device, 
And if it's a multi queue tap device, the tap device want the ton driver wants to compute the hash on the packet to figure out which one to put it in. Or for XDP, it's using a CPU based algorithm. I would rather have a hash based algorithm, which means if the hash can follow the frame, then you can use that queue selection using the data that you would just like you would for an XD, for an XKB. So anyway, we can talk about that at some point, but yeah, I would like to see some of this data that is more standard become um, kind of built in aspects of the context and frame as opposed to considering it as hardware or hints. Uh, let's see, switching gears from host ingress to VM egress. So in this case, we're talking about packets coming out of a virtual machine and going out of the, the host itself. So the focus for XB, XDP development to date has been RX into a server. And the, the TX path has its own set of challenges, right? And so some of those, again, you have to disable hardware acceleration features to take advantage of XDP, which gets to be a borderline performance uh, the problem with, so for example, with checksum and TSO, it's not a matter of disabling it in the kernel, it's a matter of disabling it in the guest, right? And so now you have to modify the VM config, for example, with, with Libvirt to say, disable TSO, disable CSUM. And again, you start getting into this battle of, I have a cool software acceleration feature, but you gotta disable hardware acceleration, which is a, a non-winning argument. Another part of this is the VLAN acceleration, right? So with cloud hosts, VLANs are used to separate traffic and the VLANs are transparent to the virtual machines. And so you, right now to use XDP on uh, VM egress packets, you have to insert the, the, the VLAN header yourself inside the program, right? Now, if the VLAN tag was a part of the XDP frame and the driver knew to look and the XDP frame to say, oh, here's the VLAN tag, does it better integrate with the hardware acceleration aspects of it, right? And, you know, I've gone back and forth with some emails with Saeed about this. When I look at the hardware hints, it's not obvious to me how to extend that proposal to the, the transmission path. Another major problem with using XDP on um, VM egress, the hosts are threads and those threads are just any, other, just any other schedulable task in that it can migrate from CPUs across CPUs in the host. And if that CPU that the vhost thread is running on does not map to a NIC queue and you try to do an XCP redirect, the package is dropped because the driver can't do anything with it. And it is extremely puzzling to go figure this out because in some cases, packets are moving just fine. In other cases, intermittent drops or just if the thread gets stuck on that CPU for a while, you just get lost in networking com completely. And you're like, well, wait a minute, it just worked, what's going on? And this is really becoming a problem with these larger systems, right? So for example, we have a lot of servers with greater than 64 logical CPUs and you're running out of per CPU NIC queues at that point. So we need to be thinking about how to address this problem. And I don't, maybe it's just a matter of always setting CPU affinity on the vhost threads. But even that is not a simple solution because the mapping of NIC queues to CPUs is a bit of a nightmare. And this is a couple of examples of one server with 96 CPUs and that's the mappings. You know, it starts off kind of zero to 19, easy to figure out. And then it's all the odd logical CPUs, which is ignoring a NUMA domain, but that's a different problem. And then you go to a different server, which has 112 CPUs, and you get a completely different mapping. And again, you have to have the software that has to go figure out what are the CPUs that I could run the vhost thread on, which also gets into other management aspects when you start talking about um, how you're setting up your cloud host. Uh, the last set of problems gets into uh, XDP with bonds. So when you're redirecting a packet, you have to tell it which NIC port, not the bond, because the bond doesn't support XDP. And so you're having to redirect this packet to either ETH0 or ETH1, and how do you pick that leg? You know, I've looked at trying to expose a helper to tap into the bond driver to say, hey, can you figure out based on your current logic? 
And then when it comes to L3, L4 hashing on the packet to figure out which leg to take, that's a, it's a non-winning direction because you, you have to have an SKB and replicating that code for XDP is just, it's way too much overhead for the return on the investment. And what I've gone to for the past seven, eight months now is I've just replicated the bond algorithm in EVPF. And again, kind of like the VHOS thread, maybe this is one we just have to eat and love with that difference of XDP versus full stack. Uh, the last topic is what it means to run XDP programs inside virtual machines. So in this case, you want to allow the guest OS to attach an XDP program to one of the guest net devices. For example, one use case is like the VM is running Kubernetes and it wants to leverage the new Cilium options with XDP. What are some things that have to be done for the guest? Well, the first requirement, you know, vhost and tap is the best networking performance outside of going with SROV, but let's stick with the vhost tap device. And the internet side has twice as many queues as virtual CPUs, and that's a per neck requirement. And every one of those queues represents a vhost thread. So as an example, 4B CPU VM with two NICs, one on a public interface and one on a private network, um, you have to have eight queues per NIC. And so that now that 4B CPU VM turns into a 20 some odd thread scheduling problem inside the host, right? And so that's really a non-starter to have that many schedulable entities for a VM and the impact it has on the host side. We really need a way to, to drop this requirement. And one proposal I had made was since, this ex since the extra queues are only needed for the transmit path, if the queues don't exist, maybe just don't allow XTP transmit, right? So in which case, VMs can use XTP programs on the NIC to do redirects inside, but can't do redirect from one interface to another or from a container to a um, egress, doing egress out, out of the VM. The other option that was thrown out was to use locking for the queues. Um, Personally, I don't have a preference. It's more of finding a solution to the fact that you can't have this, this hard requirement of so many queues and what that means from a cloud host. Let's see, uh, another program, another problem with, get, with running XTP programs in virtual machines is again, hardware aspects of it, the hardware offload aspects of it. So if you load an XTP program inside of a virtual machine, the VertIO net code is calling down into the host in the QMU to say, hey, you need to disable TX checksum and TSO on the tap device in the host. And that gets really confusing. If you're running along, running network stuff, and all of a sudden you load a program because you want to drop packets. You don't want the, the guests to spend any cycles processing stuff. You just want to see how many you can push. But as soon as you load an XTP program, you just change the entire performance characteristic because of what the guest is doing inside the host or pushing down to the host. Um, and then it also has a, a negative impact as well in terms of the host having to, whether it's segment packets or um, you, just, you see a higher software IRQ load on the host when you load that program. All right, so that's all of the points I wanted to bring up about what it means to run XDP in a host or inside of a virtual machine. And then shifting to the other topic, which was, you know, I had spent a long time looking at XDP and the egress path. And the short answer is it died. Um, I really wanted a solution that had both the SKB path and the XTP path all hit the same program. And one, one location for the program and, and data that goes with it. But the SKB path was just too much to overcome. And so what ended up getting put in is you can run programs on XTP redirect. So essentially you have a dev map for your redirects and you use the new struct dev map val as the value for those entries. And one of the um, entries in the struct is uh, a program uh, FD that lets you attach the program to the map entry itself. And that is all I had in terms of talking points. 
Uh, thanks, David. That was uh, very important uh, details to share. And uh, so thanks for the motivation for the offloads I will, uh, and the hardware hands. I will make sure we will move forward. B before your use cases, I, I really didn't have any user. So I didn't have the motivation to push forward. Uh, now we do, and thanks for that. Um, yeah, it's just this generic thing of, uh, you know, you, you, XDP has Mindshare, and I think Dave Miller a year ago made a comment about how it's XDP and eBPF are needed to keep Linux networking stack relevant, but also getting these features in timely because, you know, companies who don't work upstream are making changes to say their architecture. Maybe they're making changes to their networking architecture. It doesn't, they don't do that very often. And they're going to make these decisions based on what exists in a kernel at a particular time, point in time. And so to have these capabilities exist in a timely manner is important. Right. Well, it's not about timing, just about, uh, you know, we want XDP to perform uh, the best always. And each and every feature we push in, which is what Jesper is trying to avoid, at uh, going to break the performance bit by bit. And uh, yeah. as Jesper puts it, uh, we're going to have like a death situation by a thousand uh, paper cuts. Uh, yeah. Paper cuts. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we're yeah. trying to be careful here, but if you're too careful, yeah, it's just hard to move. I agree with you. It is, it is, a, it is a tough line, right? I mean, XDP is about advanced networking. It's for, you're supposed to know what you're doing. You're taking shortcuts around the full stack because you have a particular environment that you're deploying in. And y yes, you, you, you need the capabilities, but then you also don't need the continual performance degradations. Right. Yeah, I, I also I also want to bring up the point that where you said you, we should put some of the stuff in the XDP underscore frame, mm -hmm. and I actually agree that we actually need to figure out some of the stuff I think should belong in the XDP frame, and some of the stuff needs to belong in the the metadata area. So yeah, that's and that's an for me, interesting the hash, the hash and the VLAN are like these are essential properties for data center networking these days. And, and, and the checksum. And uh, yeah, I had checked some on there for a while and I'm like, yeah, I could go either way on that one. But yes, having that there so that yeah, programs can, can do adjustments. It's, yeah, it, it is this fine line between what is considered a standard attribute or feature and what is non-common. Yeah. And I don't want it to come down to a, the common denominator of all hardware. It needs to be what is a reasonable feature for common networking today. Yeah, but I think it should sort of be optional. So it's, I was, I would like to also define this as maybe with BTF. So you, you, you enable. You want, you want the VLAN to be put in there. You want the, the hash to be put in there, and then you are asking to get this extra overhead, and then, then people that don't want this overhead can say, I didn't, I don't enable this to be put in the XDP frame, and I think we can do it exactly the same system as the, as described by, by Said with a, a BTF format you enable in, in the area and the XDP frame. Yeah, so going back to that, I, I believe, uh, David, you wanted to, to make these standard uh, offloads or fields to put them uh, as uh, built-in fields inside the XDP frame. Uh, so yeah, I, I like the idea, just, this makes the whole uh, XDP metadata BTF uh, approach uh, like a second class feature that you're gonna hardly use. And uh, Well, I guess I'm more separating it into custom and standard. Standard belongs in, you know, in built into the data structures where custom is more the, you know, like the flexibility of hardware hints is, is awesome. And it does allow the custom features for, you know, hardware NICs, but yet, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a fine line. Yeah, it is. But uh, if we can join both in the same approach and uh, just uh, make the uh, standard features in, in bold font and make it uh, like uh, make it obvious to everyone that these are standard fields. So mm -hmm. it's, it's better to have one approach. Um, but 
yeah, let's discuss this in email and in my submission, and uh, we'll see. Another um, one that wasn't mentioned was the 4K barrier and GSO, which is also very, very common. Right, so I believe uh, uh, Sami will address this in his multi-buffer uh, session today. Uh, so let's delegate this discussion to uh, that session. It's, uh, it's the next topic. Uh, but yeah, I agree. This will solve a lot of the egress path issues that David was experiencing with TSO and uh, checksum on TX. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, TSO on TX for VMs and uh, tab devices. So I, 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 I think with multi-buffer support, we can enable back TSO. Um, um, what else? So I have a lot of notes, um, David, and uh, I think we're running out of time. Uh, so let's check uh, at the end of the session today if we have time to discuss these. Uh, you raised a lot of uh, valid points here and I uh, would like to discuss them uh, in more details. Uh, but mainly most of your problems with the XDP, uh, with the XDPT XQ selection is should be solved by the there is a topic that we're in discussion like uh, I think that the title was making uh, net device queues a uh, first uh, citizen in, in, in the kernel first class citizen and uh, yeah we, we need to provide more control to the user in order to create XDPT queues or direct queues and give the user more controls on the XDP queues today they are just magically created inside the kernel driver and yes. they are getting assigned to CPUs randomly. And you get a, you get uh, these weird performance problems or drops and you're like, what's going on? All, all known issues, yeah. But uh, as, as an advanced user uh, as you are, I, I believe you can run into these issues very easily. I agree with you. Okay, um, any other questions, comments before we move on? So one, one, one comment about the queues. So what people, people speculated that, that we could use the device map, extend the device map value with some information about what kind of queuing mechanisms you want if you wanted to have, have a, a lock, simple one, one queue, one takes queue with a lock, or you want something else. But, but that work has sort of stalled uh, and I can see Manus is not on the participant list. Yeah, he's on so, vacation. Yeah, that's good idea, a but problem. Lots of great ideas, and it's just taking a long time to to get things in. And just remember, device maps only works for XDP direct, and we have the same problems mm -hmm. with XDP TX. So I, we need I, to generalize the solutions. Just remember, we do have drivers on the kernel right now that uh, have TXQ locking. Uh, there's two of them. One of them just has a single TXQ, so there's nothing we can do. And the second one was uh, the MV Neta driver from Marvel, which uh, it was easier when we uh, and faster when we upstream the whole thing to to have locking instead of splitting the queues. Yeah, I believe we should avoid uh, locking as uh, much as possible. Yeah, yeah. The the only the only case we should allow it is a single queue device, which XDP doesn't even make too much sense on it. Right. Okay, uh, let's move on. Uh, we'll try to come back to uh, some of these uh, issues for more further discussion at the end of the meeting, if we get the time. Um, uh, so next is the XDP multi-buffer from uh, Samih. So hi, I'm Samih from the ANA Linux team and I'm presenting to you XDP multi-buffer support. We'll be going over the motivation and the solution proposed, then we'll walk through the code changes and upcoming milestones. It's important to note that this work is presented here is based upon the original design draft by Jesper. So these are the typical use cases that the multi-buffer support should enable us to do. Supporting such use cases will result in overall performance gain for the users. First, supporting Jumbo frames will enable XDP to have a higher throughput. This is the default mode for AWS customers. 
Second, supporting header data split should result in fewer accesses to the memory and in overall performance gain. Last, XDP multi-buffer support will enable drivers to support TCP segmentation offload and large receive offload, which should reflect an overall CPU overhead. So basically, multiple packets can be segmented into one packet in both RX and TX path. It's important to keep in mind the following points when trying to walk through the design and implementation of XDP multi-buffer. Preserving the single buffer performance is important as we don't want to degrade it. Second, the EBAPF direct access feature is essential for XDP performance. Note that this feature requires a continuous memory area. So let's walk over the solution. First, use the tear room of the first buffer to store the rest of the buffers in a given XDP multi-buffer packet. We use the fragments array in the SKB shared infrastructure to store them. All current drivers in the kernel that have XDP support have a tail room for the SKB shared infrastructure. This change was introduced by Jesper a few months ago in the series that introduced frame size to the XDP buffer and XDP frame structs. Second, avoid adding an abstraction layer for supporting the direct access feature and limit XDP program to access the first buffer only. This allows us to preserve the direct access feature for the first buffer. Third, provide the XDP program with helpers that can access the page address, size, and offset of each fragment. This provides the user with limited data on the fragments, yet it should be more than enough for the typical use case. So this is the graphical view of how the structure XDP buff will look like when the multi-buffer support is introduced. We can see the tail room contains the SKB shared infrastructure where it uses the frax field only of this structure to store the information with the rest of the buffers. So basically we end up having, we end up using the frax uh, field uh, which is pointing out to the rest of the buffers in a multi-buffer packet. Let's walk over the necessary code changes. A new bit was added to the XDP buff and XDP frame structs for indicating that a given structure is using XDP buffer, a XDP multi-buffer. So for the first glance, we can just check if NR frags doesn't equal zero. This kind of approach assumes that the buffer are zeroed out when they are sent to the device and in particular, the tear room which holds the SKB shared info and contains the NR frags field. The main issue with this assumption is that the buffers that are sent to the device are not always zeroed out. The page could be recycled, for example, using page pool recycle in cache uh, function. The page memory area is not reinitialized to zero. This assumption then doesn't hold up. So, that be, uh, the MB bit is needed. This additional bit requires us to update existing functions to use it. We need to assign the multi-buffer bit when converting from XDP buff to XDP frame and vice versa. In addition, we also need to handle fragments when returning the XDP buff or XDP frame structs. In order to support XDP multi-buffer, some changes are required by the drivers as well. We need to make sure that all the drivers that do not support multi-buffer set the MB bit to zero. Moreover, drivers that are not using build SKB are required to start using it, or at least when XDP is on. Using build SKB makes sense as it uses the pre-allocated buffer instead of allocating a new buffer as done in NAPI get frags or netdev alloc SKB align, IP align, for example. So when a multi-buffer packet is received, we need to fill the XDP buff structure and pass it on to the XDP program. You can see here the, the flow that the driver uh, will go into. So we collect the buffers from the device, we fill the XDP buff structure, uh, we fill the frags field, only the frags field from the SKB shared info, which is stored in the tail room. Um, we set the 
multi buffer bit, then we pass the XDP buffer, XDP buff uh, structure to the XDP program. And when the verdict is returned, we need to handle the cases accordingly. So as I mentioned earlier, earlier if the XDP, if we get an XDP pass, we need to use build SKP to allocate the SKB and pass it on to the kernel. Uh, in cases of uh, XDP TX or XDP redirect, we need to send the frags as well when transmitting. And in case of XDP drop and XDP upward, we need to drop the fragments. So in order to access the frags information, size and offset, new BPF XDP helpers have been introduced. These helpers can help XDP users calculate the full packet size and more. A sample program which uses these helpers is also available. The program simply calculates the total number of bytes in the linear and page part of a given packet, as well as displays the packets per second. So I would like to thank you. Uh, uh, wait, uh, before I would like to thank you, I would like to uh, go over the current status and next steps uh, me and Lorenzo have sent multiple RFCs to the kernel that introduced the changes discussed here. An RFC version should be submitted soon. When NetNext opens in a few days, uh, the Marvel driver has been prepared to support XTP multi-buffer by Lorenzo. ENA patches to support XTP multi-buffer are still under work and are going to be submitted when they are ready. We are also planning to do performance testing to compare multi-buffer versus non-multi buffer. So thank you. Um, thanks, Amir. Uh, I would like to uh, raise uh, some concerns here in the chat. And I believe uh, I also saw this myself. When I saw the new struct uh, of the XDP buffer and XDP frame, I got a deja vu on how the SKB looked like, I think, 20 years ago. I'm, I'm exaggerating maybe, but uh, what are we doing to avoid uh, going back to and trying to re-implement the SKB and trying to resolve all the SKB problems we had in the past all over, all over again? Can you pinpoint an exact problem that you are referring to? I, I, I can see mm -hmm. your point in general, but we are actually working with the SKB and I'm not seeing that we're working in a similar way to the SKB. So, so the whole idea of having XDPs, the, the, the whole thing is uh, lightweight and bare bones. Like, uh, you get only the frame and some extra bits that you can interpret some way uh, to extract some more information in an indirect way. Don't want the X XDP frame to grow uh, to be over cache line size or whatever that will hit performance or even uh, be the uh, uh, like maybe, central maybe point more and more features, yeah. Maybe I can answer that. So like like Jesse says on the chat, this is an SKB light. And, and that was that was actually part of my original plan for like three years ago, so I have an SKB light. And and the XDP frame is an SKB light. But, but to keep performance, people have to enable these different features and, and buy in, into them. And we have to be very careful. We cannot have this XDP frame get get larger than one cache line because then performance is dead. So that is that is why I also before said I want actually this area we're extending the XDP frame to actually defined as 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 PTF. So you we, we have this flexible area where we can define this the stuff that the drivers need. Uh, and this can have to fit in basic in, into the last uh, 32 bytes, and you cannot go beyond that. But it is an SKB light because the next step after this is creating a full SKB. So, so that is why it's faster. What happened before is that we kept, we kept extending this SKB to handle handle uh, higher layers. Why why I see XDP is layer layer two and layer three, and that's the information we we have to provide. Uh, so I hope like that that we can keep performance by having these, you have to buy into enable these features and you can disable them again and not use, use the fields. Okay, so understand that. Uh, 
uh, currently in the design, I don't see how we are making the XDP frame uh, dynamic and extendable uh, when you go to higher uh, layer protocols and higher layer uh, levels. But yeah, this could be a valid approach. And uh, my question here is that I think we need the gatekeeper, a programma programmatic way to uh, assure that uh, we're not uh, expanding the XDP buffer beyond it needs. So um, I think I had a point in the uh, free discussion at the end of this session. So uh, let's just uh, uh, put a pin on this one and uh, we'll try to address it at the end of the meeting. Um, but basically, Jesper, I think we need to have uh, some way inside the kernel source tree that would have some sort of a benchmark or micro benchmark that would tell you, hey, you're, you're doing something wrong, you're breaking performance or you're uh, increasing the size of the XDP buffer beyond the cache line, whatever we define. Yeah, I agree. That's, that's one of my topics that we are killing performance slowly by a thousand paper cuts. Right, right. okay. Um, any performance measurements made with this approach? The multi-buffer approach? No, I haven't uh, performed performance testing yet, but it's on uh, the next milestones, as I've already stated in my last slide. So I, I have nothing to share yet, sorry. And uh, this mode is flexible, right? I can do it per bu buffer or when, when you move to this mode, the whole driver needs to be reconfigured that way. Yes, the, the whole driver needs to support this mode, obviously. It's like if you have a few multiple buffers received, then you're in a multi-buffer mode. If you're not in a, if you have single buffer, you can work with single buffer and set the bit to zero. One, one thing you have to consider is when you do XDP redirect to another device that doesn't support this multi-buffer mode, uh, you have to actually decide what to do. Right now, you, you will leak memory. <laughs> right. And I can't imagine how this is going to affect the page pool today. So I, I believe it's going to be... Yeah. I think the number of drivers that support XDP is low enough that you can probably just add support for multi-buffer to all of them. Yeah, and I'm also it. hoping that the ones that is actually support XDP redirect or the NDO XDP XMIT function, I think that it's slow enough that we can update all of them at once. Like I updated all the drivers recently to have yeah. a end. Yeah, but the main issue is with the MTU mismatch between two different drivers running concurrently and you're using XDP redirect. So this still would not, uh, this would not work the workaround. So. I didn't say it was easy. <laughs> the fundamental problem with XDP right now is that it doesn't seem to be particularly usable with real world scenarios. Um, MTUs above 4K are common, having to turn off LRO and stuff like that. It's really frustrating. Yeah, this, this work should hopefully address uh, a lot of the use cases where you have larger, have to support from larger packets, right? Yeah, and I see, I see a real, this is Jesse, I see a real need for the checksum offload to be integrated with this work because especially as you're handing around these larger huge, you know, let's say they're nine, nine kilobytes of data, right? Um, if you're having to check some of that in CPU, uh, it's going to become a real uh, consumer of cycles. Okay, so moving on. Uh, thanks, Amy. Thanks, everyone. Okay, uh, to the next topic, uh, I think, I believe it's XDP for time sensitive networking. Uh, time stamping for XDP. So uh, TSN stands for time sensitive networking. The uh, the whole thing started trying to provide bounded lat latencies for Ethernet, and by bounded we mean exact time delivery is not not uh, de delete all the jitter you had on the on the packet deliveries. 
so there has been schedulers that uh, have been sent and upstream on the kernel and you have hardware offload for a bunch of schedulers that work up to that. Uh, so we did some tests trying to figure out if AFXDP can be applied on the RX path, not the TX path where your schedulers usually work. Uh, but since the, 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 low la the bounded latency that TSN uh, requires is not the only constraint you have. There's, there's applications that you also need really low latency. So since the, uh, yeah. so since the kernel, we, we, we did some measurements on the kernel, on the initial, on some ARM devices on the kernel networking stack, and we had average packet deliveries for UDP packets, small packets between 70 and 100 microseconds. Uh, this is way above than some of the applications expect. So we, we went around and tried XDP. And the initial measurements we got were quite encouraging. We managed to get under 20 microseconds, AFXDP actually. Uh, we managed to get below 20 microseconds for, for, center, for certain packet loads and, and applications. Um, now this, this whole thing um, relies on some hacking we did to get the timestamp because I've, we've also had the talk with Dave uh, that XDP doesn't support timestamping. So what we did to measure the, the latency was pick the timestamp from the network interface or from the kernel if the network interface didn't support that, put it on the XTP metadata, which was unused, and then we could read that timestamp from the user space, pick up the, the equivalent timestamp from the user space and then compare the values. Although this is not 100% safe and this is not exactly what you want to do, uh, it, it gives us a rough idea that uh, AFXTP might be usable on the low level on the on the low latency use cases for TSM. The only the only thing we haven't been able to test because this is testing the RX path. The only thing we left out is the transmit path, and the the problem with the transmit path is in order to get uh, a clear idea of what's happening, you need to implement uh, the zero copy AFXDP. If you don't, you're just going through the kernel uh, network stack, and there's nothing and there's nothing that changes that. Uh, so you could get really similar results. Uh, and one or, another thing that makes this even better and the measurements we got are probably going to be even better is that we didn't measure all, all these on a, on a real-time real kernel. Uh, the problem is that a few months ago, BPF and the preempt RT couldn't coexist. Uh, there's been some patches which I think they got merged a few months ago that allow this coexistence. So if we do the measurements again, I'm pretty sure we're gonna get even better results on this, uh, at least on the Jitter side. Uh, can you try to explain again where you making where you were making the timestamp for the XDP programs? Yeah. If okay. it's not supported can, by hardware? Uh, you can you can pick up the timestamp from the, from, for example, on Intel hardware, you can get the RTDSC uh, instruction and you can get the number of cycles and you can, you can get the same thing on user space and then you can just compare how many cycles you've spent yeah, trying to- My question was at which point in the program li lifetime or- uh, You mean after we process the packet on user space or before we process the packet on user space? Uh, no, uh, the processing on XDP. Uh, how, how, which timestamp do you attach to the XDP frame? Okay, if the, if the hardware, if the network interface can get you a timestamp, they can use, you can use PHC and sync your clocks with user space. So you have a common right. clock. Right. Uh, so if, if, if you can get the hardware timestamp and, and the hardware supports it, you can compare the hardware time, which is pretty accurate. If you don't, you can pick up the software timestamp in the kernel and then try to approximate how much time your IRQ will take, uh, your soft IRQ will take in the kernel and try to add these values. Uh, again, I understand that this is not this is not completely accurate and this is not the best thing you can do. It's just a rough estimation uh, and the proof of concept that AFXDP can offer significantly low later, lower latencies on, on at least dequeuing the packet. Uh, and another thing that makes XDP a good model for that is that you don't need to uh, do this for every packet. So for example, if you have time syncing packets going around the network that are trying to sync your whole network, you don't need to offload those into user space. You can just have a BPF program that sends the packets that are non-sensitive to the kernel and keep your normal network stack while you offload all, all of your uh, significant traffic or time-sensitive traffic down to user space. Uh, you mean implementing the whole PTP protocol inside yeah. XDP? Yeah, you don't need to do that. 
you, you can just do the PTP on the kernel because you can just allow the PTP packets to go through the kernel, get a response from your hardware, sync properly, and then you can just offload all the critical traffic to, to a user space application. So you would avoid any jitter of moving uh, between it's, kernels? Yeah, yeah, it's not avoiding. You can, you can do a lot of things. For example, you can, you know, you can pin CPUs. Uh, with, right. You can pin CPUs uh, for your user space application so you get even faster processing times. The whole idea was to prove that uh, TSN tries to guarantee you the jitter because it's a hardware scheduler that's running over there, uh, at least from the other side. So you get the packet on a timely manner and then you have to get it to your application as fast as you can and with as little jitter as you can. So what, what Elias did was he basically implemented the hardware the hardware hint, so he put it in the metadata area. Uh, <laughs> so he just hacked up, hacked up data modified kernel and, and put this into the driver. So it's it's just because we, we don't have what, what you're proposing yet. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> the, the metadata okay. is pretty important for the, uh, the timestamp is not really important for uh, for anything that I have in mind or of, of any of my use cases, but for you know measuring this and trying to provide accurate results, uh, comparing apples to, to apples is pretty it's pre it's pretty important. Yeah, well, it's important if you want your logic to run in the inside the XDP program, so you need it there. I might want to put the uh, the two presentations that I've linked on the email, or at least on the meeting notes, so that people can have an idea on you know when to look and where to look if they have any. Any, uh, oh yeah, the, this, this presentation is already uploaded. Oh, yeah, yeah, one of them is already there. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Um, so, okay, uh, let's move on to the next topic, which is uh, similar, uh, latency related. And uh, I think it will help uh, also the time stamping and time sensitive applications. So uh, Sridhar will uh, share, uh, We'll talk about busy polling uh, support for AFXBP. Uh, okay, so let me start with the use case where busy polling would be useful for AFXBP sockets. Okay, so this is mainly targeted for applications that create AFXBP sockets that are bound to a dedicated and isolated queues. So by dedicated, what I mean is that a hardware filter directs packets to these queues based on some match criteria that identifies packets uh, that for a specific AFXTP socket. And by isolated, what I mean is that these queues don't receive any other packets. So today, this can be done using features like uh, each tool RSS context, uh, where a group of queues can be associated with its own RSS context, mm -hmm. and a hardware filter can direct packets to this group of queues. And similarly, application device queues is another feature that allows creating uh, dedicated and isolated RX and TXQ groups. So actually we have a talk that is going to, uh, we have a session that talks about this feature some in next week and we'll go over that in that session in more details. Okay, so now once we have these dedicated and isolated queues associated with these sockets, right? Uh, we can enable busy polling and what it, does is it allows an app to pull the queue only when it is ready to receive or send packets on that queue. So this basically it uh, avoids the context switches and interrupts and the nappy poll con can happen in the app context itself. Okay. Uh, let me go to the next slide. So so let us go into the details on, on the proposal and how this can be implemented. So today, when an AFXTP app tries to uh, send or receive packets, uh, it does a poll or a send system call is invoked. And if the driver has set need wake up on that queue, so the driver specific NDO XSK wake up is called. So this call uh, basically triggers an interrupt to schedule NAPI from the interrupt context. So instead, the idea here is to basically do a non-blocking NAPI busy loop that will trigger NAPI poll from the app context itself. Okay. So currently when NAPI poll, when it's called from the NAPI busy loop, uh, it uses a budget of eight. 
So this is the uh, one issue that needs to be resolved. So basically, this uh, budget of eight is too low for AFXTP, as the packet processing time is much low compared to a normal SKB data path. So we need a way to increase this budget. So one way to do this is basically we can have a configurable value via CCTL, and that can be used in a, as an argument to the NAPI PC loop. That is one change we are proposing. Okay, and then, let me go to the next slide. So the other change we need is to introduce a new NAPI state called, basically I'm calling it as no busy pole stop. So this bit can be set when an A on the NAPI associated with the queue when an AFXTP socket is bound to the device queue and it can be cleared when it is detached from the queue. And so the way we use this bit is basically after the, at the end of a NAPI busy loop, right? A busy pole stop is called today that invokes the NAPI pole one more time to enable the interrupts if required. So, but in case of uh, AFXTP zero copy socket that is doing busy polling, we, what we want is we don't want the another the NAPI poll to be called. So basically we can have this, check this bit in the busy poll stop to avoid making the call to NAPI poll. Yeah, so the other thing actually, so here is some, some in, uh, feedback I would like to get. So basically when, when should we do this busy poll triggering? So the one, the most simplest and the automatic way is basically do what we, what I'm calling is opportunistic busy polling, where this is done only when the app thread is bound to the same core as the Q vector snappy. So this is what actually Magnus suggested this option. So with this option, basically we don't need any changes to the app and the, any configuration. So it happens automatically. But the only requirement is that the app thread has to be pinned to the same core as the queue. Okay. So the other options are basically we can use a triggering the global, the busy pole setting as one mechanism or use a socket per socket busy pole option. Yeah, so actually, yeah, this, these are the three options that I'm thinking, but if, if it is okay, we can just go with the first one without we basically, we do it only if the app thread is bound to the same core as the queue. Yeah, I think that's all I had. So basically I would like to get some feedback on this specific issue on when to trigger the busy poll. And with regards to the performance, right? So actually I collected some data on an Intel 40 gig NIC. So what I noticed is that with basically the TX only test, I see significant improvement, uh, almost 20 to 20% improvement uh, compared to a without busy polling. And it is basically same as a uh, two core performance we get. With a single core, we can get the same thing. And the L2 forward is another test case that I saw uh, significant improvement. The receive drop is almost the same. I didn't see anything with the receive drop. So 20% in latency or uh, packet rate? Uh, packet rate. Okay. And actually I have some concern regarding the shared NAPI, which we have in most driver today. So most driver NAPI function today is uh, working on all of the queues that are sharing the same RQ, like the PTX queue, the kernel TQ, RX queues, and uh, for MX5, I'm talking about MX5, uh, FXP also, queues also share the same NAPI uh, loop. Um, so it appears to me that we need some locking mechanism because uh, calling NAPI from user context is, uh, requires some locking. Um, yeah, so this will require basically a vector associated with a queue, queue pair. So we cannot have yeah, multiple queues sharing the same vector. Okay, got yeah, it. So, 
requirement, yeah. So driver changes are required. Yeah, it depends on only if a driver supports that model, I think, yeah, this will be useful. Okay. Mm -hmm. So basically we need a mechanism to isolate traffic to those specific queues and also the vector associated with that queue and the application thread are on the same core. Then yeah, we can do this type of busy calling. Right, I'm thinking right now uh, for the slow path, right? AFXDP is redirecting traffic uh, directly to the um, user space, but when the uh, XDP program that is uh, parsing the packets and uh, deciding if the packet should go to the AFXDP uh, queue or to the kernel stack, then it copies the packet to the kernel stack. Um, trying to think if there are any issues with that. Um, don't believe so, but uh, I think you should look into that as well. Yeah, so, so that's why actually originally when I said right, it would be good if we can uh, isolate the queues that the, all the traffic that is coming on a queue is directed for this AFXDP socket. Right, so, so this looks to me like a new requirement, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so this, to get the real performance, actually we need to isolate the queues, traffic, via some hardware filter. Okay, I get no comments, so uh, thanks, Rudar. Uh, we'll move on to the next topic. Uh, uh, so before we uh, go into the open discussion session, uh, I would like to try to discuss the performance and page pool, uh, some page pool open issues. Uh, I think Jesper and Jonathan wanted to talk about uh, some uh, uh, prior work and uh, uh, for SKB recycling in the page pool? Oh. So the, the idea came from the fact that uh, we use an API, an internal API that allocates maps, syncs your DMA memory uh, for the network interface in the XDP use case. And that's one of the reasons uh, XDP has such a big speed improvements compared to uh, what happens on the SKB. Um, so what we figured out is that we could apply the same principle on the on the SKB uh, device path. Uh, we did this, we did send an RFC, and this is the the the, the performance improvements you're seeing on the driver. Uh, obviously, as the packets get bigger, the improvements get lost, but up to 512 megabytes uh, kilobytes, uh, you pretty much get double the performance. Uh, the reason the 257 exists on the on the chart is that the the driver uh, used to do zero copy up to, six, to 256 kilobytes. Uh, so that's, that's why you, you see the big performance boost uh, the moment the, the zero copy mechanism, the, the mechanism goes away. So what we did is that we, we added some fields on the, on the SKB uh, and when the network driver was using page pool to allocate the, the buffers uh, for, the, for the SKB data, uh, we could intercept the packet during the SKB free and just recycle into page pool. Uh, since page pool has two pools, one fast path, one really, fa one really fast and one slower path for, for recycling the pages, uh, we could recycle the page and we didn't need to unmap the buffer and map it again in order to refill the descriptors of the device. We just had to sync and invalidate the buffer towards the correct direction and fill in the hardware with the already allocated buffer. So you get away with not mapping, not, uh, not unmapping, and not allocating a new buffer. You just, you just have it pre-allocated. Uh, so the, there has been some involvement since the first RFC. Uh, one of the big issues we had on the first RFC and the way the code was structured is that we could only uh, recycle SKBs, not SKB fragments. There was, there was quite a bit of refactoring and we, we now have a patch that recycles everything. 
so you can recycle SKB and SKB fragments as well. Uh, Jonathan has added a bunch of protections against the initial code, so you make sure you you always recycle a page pool buffer because if the you know if the buffer you end up recycling is not allocated from the page pool, you blow up everything. Uh, and that's pretty much the status of we are at the moment. The, the, unfortunately, none of us had time to continue on this one and pick it up and you know try to merge it properly. But where we stand at the moment is that we have a code that's recycling everything. It seems pretty face to, safe to use. Um, uh, Jonathan, correct me if I'm wrong. You said that you were running it on some test servers and that the results were encouraging and... Yes, I was. We uh, modified the MLX for driver code, which does page pool uh, recycling, and also sends that page fragment because every buffer is 2K. So when you send the buffers up through the stack, it has an elevated drop count. And then after it's deposited and it goes to page three and notices the elevated drop count and notices it belongs to the page pool, and it's then either return to the driver or return to the page pool. So we preserve the IOMMU unmappings throughout the Rx path. Um, that's working on our Facebook external server. No problem with that. Um, what we did find is this only works for the Rx path. So since we're using the networking stack, half of the pages are coming from the transmit side which are always hitting the IOMMU, obviously, because they can't go through the page pool. So that kind of kills the performance gain that we're seeing there. Yeah, but a similar technique could be applied on the TX path, right? I mean, the, the, only, the only difference we have on the, I'm, I'm trying to think if you can do the same thing on the TX path, because the only fundamental difference between the RX path and the TX path is that on the TX path, you allocate the SKB on the fly from the, from the uh, uh, from the slab and on the RX path, you just have pre-allocated pages from page pool. So if you could allocate... Well, we would the... have to change things so that the transmit path would get pages from a page pool somehow. And I don't yeah. think anyone's done that. I certainly haven't. Yeah, I can... I, uh, can I think on, on, on TX path, you don't know which net device we're bounded to allocate from. Uh, should do it as early as possible to allocate the buffer and copy them from the SKB, uh, and from the socket buffer. Yeah, so, some, some of the gain you can get from Pacebo is because it knows it doesn't have to lock anything because it knows that, that this, this comes in from a hardware request and, and it's, it's uh, protected by the software queue. In the TX case, we don't have, have this ability so you need to take some locks and all of a sudden it gets more expensive so yeah. no i'm not i'm not implying this will have the same performance right, on the sign because when you come back in through the page three that doesn't go through the hot path to the page pool doesn't go through the nappy protection so you always take the lock where you put it in the general ring so that was another um performance impact there and to be fixed. Yeah, that's also that's definitely something that we need to fix somehow. But I have have a lot of ideas, but not enough time to implement them. Yeah. In any case, just the I find a BSD page model where you have a per CPU allocator, but that really didn't get in well. Probably wasn't using a large enough magazine size to handle the traffic. Uh, but, but you need a pair CPU and pair oh, driver yeah. allocator for the DMA mappings. Uh, you can have a pool per driver. I'm not so sure why it has to be per CPU though. Well, uh, to avoid locking. Yeah, that, okay. There are some structures you can use without locking, but yeah. Uh, not when multiple CPUs are touching these structures. Um, I mean, a consumer producer, I don't think it, um, it can work like that way. And the main idea here is that this is, 
easily pluggable, pluggable on devices that support XDP because you're supposed to use page pool already when you're using XDP uh, for, your, for your buffer allocation. So since you're using page pool already for XDP, why don't just allocate the SKB data as well with that? And if we manage to apply that and figure out that it's safe, uh, you can just get a performance for free because there's, uh, keep in mind, these results are without an IMU. If an IMMU kicks in, this is going to get even worse. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, well, I understand the need, just uh, for TX, it's harder to achieve than RX. And for RX, I believe we have issues to resolve. Like in MNX4 and in MNX5, I think we have the flip page. So the same page could be used for two SKBs. And uh, with, yeah. with that enabled, you're just uh, the ah, proof won't work. Yeah, yeah. If you go back to the the notes I've sent you, this is this is mentioned. Can you uh, go back to the notes so I won't we won't miss anything at least from what I had in mind. Right. So the problem is the split page memory model. <laughs> right. Uh, Jasper had a. I I don't know if he wants to elaborate on the proposal. He quickly said he he quickly once we discussed this he had an interesting idea. <laughs> I did. I just said it. I'm not sure it's a good idea to, to have a split page memory model. And if and 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 I don't like that if we try to shoehorn in a, a split page memory model for for the page pool, I would rather have we we, we add a new memory type that I, where that we can identify because we added in the, the 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 memory type so we can have another memory type that that supports this more explicitly, uh, but, and I think we can still share some code with the page pool actually, but maybe it's worth having another memory type if we have this, this split page stuff, instead of trying to shoehorn horn it into page pool. But that's, I think it's down to the coding details. You can use the page pool with a split page memory model the issue is that the driver has to be responsible to maintain the elevated reference count, not the page pool. Yes. Yeah, that, that can, could work easily for XDP workloads like XDP drop and TX, but for stack uh, pass, XDP pass, uh, the last one to, to free this is KB. Is it works for stack by. But what is some something else elevates the ref count and it's not the last the page pool call is not the last one to decrement it. Then you you miss a DMA mapping. But you miss a DMA unmap. <coughs> right, Unless you detect the that and uh, you the take out the pool. around that. Was essentially the driver holds a certain number of rough counts, the driver references. You send the fragment up the stack, and the fragment uh, normally hits just release page. And because the driver is holding elevated rough counts, it doesn't actually go back to the system. When the driver goes to reuse the fragment again, it notices that the reference counts on the page are higher than the buff counts that it's still holding. At that page, it does the recycling from the driver, released from the driver. So the uh, page can be released from the driver back to the pool or from the system back to the pool, and that works. Uh, but my point is that the driver still has to be responsible for maintaining this elevated rough count. We can't push it off to the page pool. <coughs> No, no, that's 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 true. But that's also why I think maybe it's, we should be explicit about it and and put another another type on it so so the the code can can tell the difference. When 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 you do this extra elevated ref counts, what happens is that you have to touch the ref counts in the in the driver, right? <clears throat> and one of the key elements of the, in the page pool is that you don't have you only have to read it on the remote CPU. If it gets freed on the remote, you don't have to update it actually. If you notice it, it has it can only be one. I, we've never thought about this before, or I've never thought about it before. What if we added a new flag to the to the page um, memory allocation structures that said you know the page was allocated with the DMA mapping 
and then let the page uh, allocator free the DMA mapping as part of the free pass if it ever sees the ref count go to zero. Well, we have the DMA mapping on struct page. So I know, but does the page pool know about that? The page pool adds that, but it doesn't piggyback on it to free. That's an interesting idea. That's that's all I'm saying. Yeah, but I think for, for to call to do the DMA on Mac call, you need the the device pointer also. Uh, yeah. And that's that is stored in the page pool objects, and that's how we get it back. But you could, it is sort of possible. <laughs> yeah, as long as you can figure out the device and the we we have we don't we don't have the direction as well because you know you don't need the direction on map. Uh, you just need the device. Yeah, that that might work. It might work because because we made made the change that we make sure that the page pool ID is still up and running so the page pool pointer is still valid. That's yeah. Like Jonathan made me change some some things to keep track of in flight packets, and that actually means that we can actually speed up freeing of the pages quite significantly by by using the directly accessing the page pool objects via uh, yeah, pointer instead of having to do a lookup table, but that's also coding details. Okay, uh, guys, just a time check. We only have 12 minutes left, and I would like to uh, have some free time for uh, open discussion. Um, Jonathan, just let me know if you want to talk about your zero copy header split uh, patches and mid GPU stuff. Uh, I'll open it to questions. I don't have slides for that GPU, so I could always just postpone that if you want. Um, essentially, uh, I'll open up to questions. Okay, so um, so we're here in the open discussion, and uh, we got uh, twelve minutes left, so. Um, here are some topics to discuss. Uh, basically, we covered some of these, and um, um, I would like to actually hear some comments or open issues that we didn't cover today, so it's a time to raise them up. I see a nice overlap for the multi-buffer stuff with the header data split um, functionality. Those two can be combined um, like if the multi-buffer goes in in some way, shape, or form, it would give us the ability to use header data split with XDP traffic. Oh, right. But uh, I basically put the header data split here because I wanted to talk uh, API. Like uh, how, how do you allow, do you do it per queue? Uh, how would the user should ask to enable data header split? Because legacy hardware today, uh, most of them, they don't know how to do data split. They only know how to... Uh, data split not according to specific header, but just by fixed size uh, header. Um, so we're missing some APIs for this. It's a low hanging food for many use cases like uh, what uh, Jonathan is working uh, on uh, GPU uh, zero copy. Yeah, the um, Intel hardware has a whole bunch of controls over this. Um, we can support header data split on like four different modes. There's the, you know, fixed split, the header only split, header replication, right, et cetera. So you're right, there is no API for configuring this stuff for our hardware, and we can do it per queue, although we would have to reset the queue when you turned it on or off. Yeah, I think it's a static configuration, so I don't think anyone would mind if you reset the queue. So Just, what do you think for... Uh, well... <laughs> what do you think for interface, I mean, ETH tool or DevLink? Um, well, neither. <laughs> uh, well, let me interject here. Since it's, um, this is part of the work that I'm doing for NetGPU. Um, in fact, let me just explain what I was trying to accomplish. For NetGPU, the initial goal was we have this huge machine learning cluster where we have incoming traffic and we want most of the data is going to go through the GPU. Now, we don't, for various reasons, we don't want to use RDMA. So what we'd like to do is keep all of the protocol processing in the hope 
but still there's no reason to send all the data to the host since it doesn't use it. It's going to the GPU. So once you split the headers to go to the host, so it can do the protocol processing and send all the data to the GPU directly. All right, that was the initial motivation. So we want to change the driver to do some kind of header splitting. So we do split the buffer for the initial receive buffer will go into a buffer map to the host and all the other receive for the data uh, section of the packet will go into buffers that are mapped to the GPU or even an NVMe device in the future. So that's what we're trying to do here. We found that the XDP, AFXDP, this is very similar to how AFXDP works, except that AFXDP bypasses the entire protocol stack. It throws the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak. So what we want to do is do the same thing. We want to send the, everything through the TCP stack or the UDP stack, and then data arrives in the form of the same AFXDP form. It'll just be written to a user space ring. They'll notify, oh, the data is here, but now it may not be here. It's over in the GPU, but we can still control it. So that's essentially the genesis of, of what that GPU is supposed to do. To implement this, I kind of extended some of the AFXDP concepts. So we have a socket queue, an interface queue, a memory model, a con RSS context. Uh, so it changed the MLX5 driver. So when I bind to an interface, I bind to a device, it actually creates a new receive queue, uh, kind of like the AFXDP receive queue, and then sets header split properties just on that queue without changing anything else on the bus, the, the current receive queue. So that's possible to do now. And uh, could you explain how you did the configuration for the data split? What API did you use to configure the queue uh, according to the data header split you were looking for? Um, for right now, I'm trying to keep things as automatic as possible. So right now, the API is that the user space request an interface queue. Essentially, we have a kind of like a RSS context. Okay. So we request an interface queue from the device that'll be attached to this RSS context. Right now, the only API that I currently have is that we require header splitting on that uh, received queue. In the future, I can be better on this. Um, I'm only trying to do what's needed right now instead of trying to come up with everything as a uh, current API, but in the future I can see the request to the device for a queue could be bind to a specific CPU, bind to a mapper, do other things, but that's currently not implemented. How we do it right now is we simply request a new receive queue from the hardware that's doing header split, and then we populate it with the memory, specific memory that we want to receive and to. Okay, so um, I, I believe for AFXDP, uh, API could be as easy as its socket options because uh, each uh, AFXDP socket has its own uh, queue inside the device. And uh, using SIT socket options, you can uh, configure whatever attribute you're looking for and uh, we can make it standardized because the AFXDP is a well-known socket and uh, uh, we can uh, add to right. that API. Right. So, so uh, FXDP, your, uh, your, uh, it's kind of a mess, but initial design was you open an AFXDP socket and that uh, kind of equals to an interface queue. We have uh, extensions where you can open multiple AFXDP sockets and they share the same interface queue. That's kind of messy. So in my next GPU, we just we have multiple protocol sockets that can share an interface queue, but we request an interface queue specifically. I was initially yeah. hoping to just use the AFXDP API. So 
currently not done. I'm hoping in the future we can merge the two together so we don't have two separate API. Right, we, we can take the common parts and make it a, an abstract layer for both AFXDP and uh, GPU. But uh, well, I want to go back to Jesse's comment here regarding the API. Uh, because, so, uh, as said, uh, uh, either data split and uh, the multi-buffer, uh, uh, they go uh, together. And uh, I think uh, the API is required to configure the standard net device queues to do header data split and to do uh, multi-buffer uh, in order to achieve TSO, GRO, whatever we want with the header data split. Uh, so again, this all boils down to the uh, net device queues discussion where we want to make a net device queues more controllable. And in terms of API, I think the proposed API was Netlink and uh, I support that decision and uh, we need to try to push that forward as well. So the answer is, should be a net link and using net device queues uh, um, as a main object to manipulate and uh, configure for multi-buffer uh, header data split and uh, attach the AFXDP sockets, uh, TX queues, XDP redirect, and give the user the full control. Uh, that would solve many issues that were raised today in this uh, session. Um, so I think we need to resurrect that discussion. I think it was uh, a year ago, a half a year ago, and, and uh, it's time to make it happen. Um, right. I believe right now the queue collection is done via an NDO BPF call. Uh, it'd be nice to have a better way of creating and manipulating queues than that. Right, so it's tailored to the use case, right? And in your code, you just uh, replicated the AFXDP code to your own use case. And uh, there are a lot of common stuff. And I think we need to make the networking queue as, as it was say, the first class that is inside the, net, uh, inside the kernel. And you can create one, give it the attribute, and attach it to whatever application, uh, socket, uh, net device queues, or hardware IRQ uh, queue. Uh, just give the user the full ability and control uh, to put it and attach it to whatever uh, the user wants. Um, okay, we have one minute left to go. Um, any questions, uh, comments? So I have a question for Jonathan regarding the net GPU patches. So is that targeted mainly for uh, GPU only or I thought, I think your patches also supported TXRX zero copy to the host applications also, right? Are you planning I to- I support um, zero copy to the host memory as well. As well, okay. So, is the plan to support that mode also? Right. No, it does support this model already. The support directly for um, the NVIDIA virtual people not going to make sure, but also support zero copy to host memory, and that's working today. I'm currently working on extending UDP to support zero copy UDP VC, if anyone cares. Okay, thank you, Jonathan. And um, in case there are no more questions or comments, um, I would like to conclude here. Okay, so thanks everyone for joining. It was a really helpful and fruitful discussions today. Uh, we got a lot uh, to go cover and uh, we didn't cover also a lot of uh, raised issues. Um, so thanks for joining and thanks for the panel members uh, for sharing their work. And thanks for the organizers for this great uh, conference. Uh, see you soon. Thanks. Bye-bye.